Welcome. My name is Jerry Oginski. I'm a medical malpractice trial attorney practicing law here in the state of New York. Thank you for joining me. Today's topic is going to be medical malpractice, 10 reasons why most malpractice victims don't recover a dime. The first thing you're going to learn about is that most patients, when they are injured, don't realize that they've suffered injury at the hands of a doctor or a hospital. That is the number one reason why most victims do not recover any money. And that's a significant thing. Most doctors or hospitals are not going to own up and admit to causing injury to a patient while in their hospital or under their care in an office. It just doesn't happen. Number two, in a case involving a death, no autopsy is performed. When an autopsy is done, it allows us information. It gives us information that I need to know in order to determine the cause of death. Without knowing the precise cause of death in a death action, it becomes extremely difficult to prove that whatever wrongdoing occurred caused the patient's death. That's number two. Number three, a physician's poor bedside manner does not constitute evidence of negligence. You've all encountered people who have not had good bedside manners. Everybody's had it. However, just because a doctor does not hold your hand, does not tell you how great things are, or is gruff, does not mean that they've done something wrong. On the other hand, there have been very good doctors with excellent bedside manners who may in fact have caused an injury. But again, bad bedside manner does not equate to a departure from good and accepted medical practice. Number four, the patient has not suffered significant damages. If you remember from one of my other videos, it's important to know what we have to prove in order to show that you have a valid malpractice case. One of the first things is that I have to show that there were departures from good and accepted care. The second thing I have to show is that the departures from good care caused the injury and that the injury is significant and permanent. And all three of those things have to be confirmed by an expert in order to be able to prove a successful case. In a situation where a patient has not suffered significant injury, then it becomes impossible, if not extremely difficult, to prove a successful case. That's number four. Number five, the doctor or the hospital's mismanagement did not necessarily cause the injury suffered. If you remember, that's number two in the elements that I need to prove a successful case. Many times we are able to show that there was wrongdoing, but the wrongdoing may not have caused injury. And yes, the person or the patient has injuries, but unless we're able to show a connection that the injury suffered was directly related to the departures from good and accepted care, again, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to prove that we have a successful case. Number six, the injured victim or the patient has not retained an experienced medical malpractice attorney. This is a bigger problem than you think. There are many lawyers out there who practice in other areas of law, whether it's personal injury, whether it's general practice, whether it's real estate, or whatever. If you go to an attorney who does not handle malpractice matters on a regular basis, you may experience a problem because that lawyer or law firm may not have the resources or knowledge necessary in order to handle your case to a successful completion. Now, there's no guarantee with any type of case, but the better experienced attorney and law firm that you have, the greater likelihood that you will have a good outcome or certainly a good experience during the course of the litigation. That's crucial because if you don't have an attorney who knows the detailed malpractice laws, you're going to be uh, in a difficult situation where you're going to be behind the eight ball and it's going to cost you severely in your case. Number seven. The time limit to bring a lawsuit may have expired. That's what we lawyers call a statute of limitations. Every state has that. In New York, there are specific time limits in which to bring a lawsuit against a doctor or a hospital. The time limits are shorter if you're going to bring a lawsuit against the city, a municipal hospital, or the state. Those are crucial and it's vital that you Thing. If you think you have a potential case, that you contact an attorney immediately because your time to bring a lawsuit or a claim may expire before you get around to contacting an attorney. So many times a patient will call someone who's been injured and learn for the very first time that the time they had to bring a lawsuit has gone. 
And once the statute of limitations, once the time period has lapsed, there is absolutely nothing I or any other attorney in the state of New York can do to get your case back on track. Number eight, jurors have been biased by the insurance industry. That's a plain and simple fact, and you see it every single day in the newspaper. You see it in TV ads. You see it on, you hear it on radio. There are so many things that we go through and see and hear every single day of our lives that it's, we, we're starting with strikes against us when we walk into the court. And now we have to select a jury who's supposed to be impartial. But the fact is, jurors know that if verdicts continue against big businesses and against hospitals and doctors, that insurance premiums raise and go up after a period of time, similar to what happens with their car insurance or homeowner's insurance. So we already have a strike against us where the jurors tend to be biased by the propaganda generated by the insurance industry. And this is not something that I'm generating. This is something that's so obvious that you realize is out there every single day. Another reason why, and this is number nine on my list of top ten things, why most malpractice victims do not recover a dime is because once a lawyer, once a, a patient has gone to an attorney, it is often difficult to find a qualified expert in order to testify against those doctors or hospitals that caused you injury. There are many reasons why a doctor will refuse to testify against a colleague. Many times they don't want to get involved. They don't want to spend the time and effort and energy. They don't want a bad reputation in the community where they are known to testify against other doctors. And oftentimes, a lawyer will have to go out of their local town or geographic area and have to go out of state to find a qualified board certified expert to be able to testify against those individuals that may have caused you harm. Number 10, and here's something that's so obvious that most people don't even realize. Juries like doctors. That's a plain and simple fact. We all go to them, we rely on them, we trust them. When we are ill, we go to them to get better. So, we, again, we have another strike against us when we walk into the jury room to select a jury of impartial people. Juries tend to like doctors, and why shouldn't they? Because they trust doctors, doctors have specialized training and knowledge, and that's an inherent bias against the patient and the injured victim who's coming into court seeking to be compensated for their injuries. During the course of jury selection, we try and explain to the jury that even though a doctor may be excellent in their field, may be very good and very well qualified, we are claiming that at a particular time, at a particular date, a, this particular doctor did not treat the patient in accordance with good and accepted medical care. And we ask the jury if they can understand that and separate that from their own experience of going to the doctor and having no problem. That's it for today's discussion of the top 10 reasons why most malpractice victims don't recover a dime. I'm Jerry Oginski. Have a great day and thanks for joining us.